On the 7th of May 1945, at 2.41 in the morning, the German High Command and the rump Nazi government of President Karl Dönitz, Hitler's successor as head of state, reluctantly agreed to surrender. The unconditional surrender papers were signed at Reims in France by Colonel General Alfred Jodl, chief of the operations staff of the Wehrmacht. The instrument of surrender was to take effect at 11.01 p.m. on the 8th of May 1945, a day that would be called Victory in Europe, or VE Day, thereafter. However, though the surrender was agreed, and a further surrender ceremony was arranged to appease the Soviets in occupied Berlin on the 9th of May, the German armed forces continued military operations in several areas as the surrender took time to implement. The Air Force, or Luftwaffe, launched one of its last large-scale missions on the 8th of May, a desperate rescue mission that went disastrously wrong. The mission was launched into an area of Eastern Europe the Germans called the Kurland Pocket. The Kurland Peninsula is a region of western Latvia in the Baltic states, the area having been occupied by the Germans during the attack on the Soviet Union in 1941. By July 1944, a large force of German divisions had been pushed into the Kurland Peninsula by the Soviet advance on the Baltic states. German Army Group North had become cut off from the rest of the German front. Trapped, the Army Group had fought on, on the 25th of January 1945, renamed Army Group Kurland. As the military situation continued to deteriorate for Germany as 1945 progressed and Soviet forces pushed into the east of the country, the generals constantly asked Hitler to evacuate Army Group Kurland back to the Reich, its dozens of divisions desperately needed to shore up the crumbling Eastern Front. Hitler consistently refused, believing that Army Group Kurland's presence tied down huge Soviet forces in containing the pocket, but the Red Army had plenty of strength to spare by 1945, rendering Hitler's argument basically nonsensical. By mid-January 1945, Colonel General Heinz Guderian managed to persuade Hitler to withdraw seven divisions from the pocket while the Soviets hammered away at the pocket whose defences held. By the 8th of May 1945, there were still 27 and a half German divisions trapped in the Kurland Peninsula, and though surrender negotiations were opened with the besieging Soviets, it would take several days after VE Day before the 190,000 German troops actually laid down their arms. The problem for the members of Army Group Kurland was obvious. No one wanted to become a prisoner of the Soviets. Facing them was years in Soviet labour camps, and most would not survive. It would be seen as payback by the Soviets after the appalling treatment of Soviet prisoners of war by the Germans, up to three million having died in German captivity. The alternative was escape to the West and better terms from the British and Americans, or perhaps even escape to a neutral country, and the chance of seeing their families again. But how to get out? The pocket surrounded by sea on three sides. Grand Admiral Dernitz had already ordered the evacuation of German civilians and soldiers from areas of Kurland, East Prussia and the Polish Corridor that were in danger of being overrun by the Soviets from January 1945. Codenamed Operation Hannibal, over a period of 15 weeks, the German Navy managed to evacuate between 800 and 900,000 German civilians and 350,000 soldiers across the Baltic Sea to Germany and Denmark. Soviet submarines sank many of the evacuation ships, the most infamous case being the torpedoing of the German liner Wilhelm Gustloff on the 30th of January 1945, resulting in the deaths of 9,400 people, the worst disaster ever at sea. Dönitz had tried to delay the final German surrender so that Hannibal would continue operations, 
but the western allies had threatened to refuse acceptance of german refugees and troops if dönitz did not surrender immediately now it was the turn of the luftwaffe to make the final effort to save as many german servicemen of army group kurland from soviet captivity the aerial operation was a fairly ad hoc affair seemingly put together at the last minute as the surrender of the seventh of may was not expected hundreds of german aircraft from dozens of units were mobilized to make mercy flights into the pocket in the face of heavy soviet air and ground opposition and pluck whomever they could to safety the operation would run on the eighth and ninth of may nineteen forty five one of the last luftwaffe operations before the official disbandment of the organization as part of the terms of surrender several operations were mounted but one of the largest was that sent to grobina airfield in kurland on the eighth of may a huge force of german aircraft took off from bases in norway itself still under complete german control at the end of the war the force consisted of thirty five junkers ju fifty two three m transports and four heinkel h e one eleven bombers The Ju-52, nicknamed the Iron Annie by Western forces and Anti-U by German soldiers, had been the main transport plane of the Luftwaffe during the war and was also used to drop paratroopers. The Heinkel 111 had seen extensive service before the war in the Spanish Civil War and during the early bombing campaign against the UK, during the Battle of Britain and the Blitz, and on all other German war fronts. A special paratroop transport version, the H-20, was probably employed on the Kurland evacuation mission owing to its larger capacity to carry troops. Due to the German surrender, all of the aircraft flew unarmed and unescorted. At Grobina airfield, wounded German soldiers awaited evacuation. The wounded would probably not survive harsh Soviet captivity. There were also some unwounded German soldiers waiting to go. They were all married men with families who had been selected by their units to be sent home. Each German aircraft would be overloaded with between 20 and 30 soldiers for the flight out and to make more space each aircraft's crew had been reduced to only the pilot and navigator these flights represented the very last opportunity for a lucky few to get out of soviet hands and the desperation was as palpable as the last evacuation flights out of surrounded stalingrad two years earlier Other aircraft also participated on the 8th of May, also flying from Norway. Some Junkers Ju-88s took off from Vernes in Norway and headed for an airfield in the pocket to collect wounded. The Ju-88s would ultimately fare better than the slow, lumbering and overloaded Ju-52s and Heinkel 111s. All of the German aircraft managed to reach their assigned airfields in the pocket and began frantic loading operations. It was a one-way ticket to freedom for those who were picked to go aboard, but the flight was incredibly dangerous. Soviet aircraft patrolled the skies over Kurland and out over the Baltic Sea, and would shoot down any Luftwaffe aircraft they encountered, regardless of the surrender. What happened to the Ju-52s and HE-111s that departed from Grobina was nothing less than a turkey shoot. Assailed by over 100 Soviet Yak fighters and Sturmovik attack aircraft, the unarmed and overloaded German transports were slaughtered. All four of the Heinkel 111s were shot down, along with 33 out of the 35 Ju-52s, everyone aboard being killed. Only two Ju-52s survived to land in Germany, 
where pilots had managed to evade the Soviet patrols by flying only 60 feet above the surface of the sea, sneaking through until out of range. The Ju-88s, due to their higher speed and manoeuvrability, managed to make it to German territory largely unscathed. In fact, one of the evacuation planes was logged as the last American aerial victory in Europe, when an anti-aircraft battery protecting the U.S. airfield at Eschwege, 25 miles southeast of the German city of Kassel, engaged an approaching Junkers 88. The German pilot made a wheels-up belly landing in a field near the airbase. Aboard were two crew and ten passengers, plucked from Kurland. The Junkers 88 had been almost out of fuel when the pilot spotted Eschwege airfield. U.S. personnel cut the crew and passengers from the plane and took them prisoner. Not every German aircraft escaped from Kurland went to German territory. Many pilots took their chances and flew to neutral Sweden instead. Several Fokkerwulf FW-190 fighters landed at Swedish airfields on the 8th of May 1945, their pilots being interned and the aircraft seized. Each aircraft had been crammed with a couple of hardy ground crew for the flight to freedom, stuffed into tiny equipment bays. Luftwaffe Dornier 24 flying boats also took out some people from Kurland. Some landed in Sweden, while others made risky trips into and out of Kurland and back to German territory. These aircraft marked with a red cross in a white circle on the nose and tail. One unit managed to bring out 116 people in this manner. But for most members of Army Group Kurland, they were not so lucky. And on the 9th of May 1945, the German surrender terms were accepted. On the 12th of May, 190,000 German troops, including 42 generals, surrendered, with the pocket cleared by the 23rd of May. The prisoners of war were fed into the Soviet labor camp system, with the survivors eventually repatriated to Germany in the early to mid 1950s. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.